Mr. and Mrs. R. A. Howard, 619 Stanley, in Ardmore, Oklahoma, on March 14th, 1956. My, my name is Robert Allen Howard. I was born August the 22nd. 1873 in Graves County, Kentucky. Should have been a politician, I guess, because I was born in a one-room log house in a big family. I uh, became dissatisfied with that part of the country and had my daddy to come out to Texas when I was 14 months old. And grew up in uh, what is now Bosque County, Texas, which is about uh, 60 or 70 miles south of Fort Worth. After, uh, and, and while I lived uh, in Bosque County and at Meridian, which is the county seat of Bosque County, I was admitted to the bar in, uh, on the 23rd day of January, uh, 1896, which makes me now in my 61st year practicing law. It been a little over 60 years ago when I was admitted to the bar. I, uh, Fort Meridian was too small a town for me to practice in, and I was getting ready to leave Meridian, Meridian, Texas, when uh, the war with Spain broke out. And that was giving me an opportunity to leave, so I enlisted in the war with Spain in April, 1898. And, uh, served a little over nine months. In the meantime, my folks had left Meridian and came to Taro Indian Territory. The uh, International and Great Northern Railroad then that went to Laredo where I was uh, stationed as a soldier out of the bigness of its heart gave us boys transportation across the great state of Texas for five dollars. I took advantage of that and rode on the train from Laredo, Texas to uh, uh, St. Joe, Locona, Locona, Texas. And from there I paid the regular fare to uh, Ringo and changed railroads there and, and uh, was soon at Terrell Indian Territory where my family lived. And uh, <clears throat> at that time there was a good deal of agitation about uh, the uh, Indian Territory joining with Oklahoma and becoming a great state. And, I wanted to see that it was done right, so I decided to stay in Union Territory and help build the great state of Oklahoma. I'd always been used to farming, farming country, and uh, decided that Paul Valley might be the place for me to locate, which I did. But at Terrell, Indian Territory, I run across a little gal that uh, kind of tickled my fancy. Her name was, uh, uh, she was known as Pearl Biggs. And uh, I went on to Paul's Valley and, and uh, we kept up correspondence. And finally her, her father, moved to Erin Springs and on the 6th day of October 
19 and 1. I went up there in Springs and took that girl uh, back to Falls Valley as my bride. We stayed in Falls Valley where I'd become kind of established in the practice of law until uh, the second day of February, 1902, when uh, I was offered a position in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of the Union Territory and uh, came to Ardmore, arriving here on the second day of February, 1902. And pretty soon after that, I bought a lot on what was in 2nd Avenue. Afterwards, was a room and the boulevard. And uh, as soon as I could, I built a house on that lot and uh, brought the new bride. And we've lived on that lot ever since. Now, we uh, celebrated our golden anniversary there, and now we've been living there that same lot, right where this record is being made. Uh, we've lived there for 55 years. In the meantime, the house got too small for the big family that I raised, a couple of boys, and uh, we had to build us a bigger house and move the other one off just to block north. But uh, that's where we're living now, and that's where this record is being made. Okay. I uh, have seen lots of changes in uh, the more than half a century that I've lived on this lot. Uh, at that time, H Street Southwest, which was uh, a block and a half west of where uh, this record is being made and where we uh, lived then, was the uh, southwestern boundary of Ardmore. In fact, the town cows passed in front of our house and uh, were turned in a pasture in uh, a block and a half of where we now live, and the boys would go get them and bring them back by our house and we'd ride our little shade trees and play havoc with our shrubbery. We had to have yard fences then and but sometimes the gates would be left open and uh, no paving out this way. Lots of dust but uh, we got along and we were fairly happy and, I guess, all right. Mr. Howard, uh, you being a man in uh, politics, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about the government here. Well, <clears throat> there was no special government except the uh, United States Court that time Judge Towns, who was the United States judge, and just a little while before we came, the city had been organized as a city and was presided over by, at that time, by Mayor Bob Dick, who uh, seemed to have remained there until uh, the best I can recollect until about statehood, which was in 1907. And uh, it 
was uh, Bob, Bob Dick was there that the Carnegie Library was built on the lot or the block that it now stands on, which was a three-cornered lot. And then, then it was known as Second Avenue Southwest, and between. Uh, e, 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 and F. And they came, and those two streets came together at the south end of the block on which uh, the Carnegie Library was built. It was an old two story building out of, uh, built out of uh, artificial stone. And, uh, while my boys were going to school in the Lincoln School, uh, they came a storm and kind of wrecked that building a little and weakened it. And then when the explosion came in uh, 1913, it so wrecked that building that it had to be condemned and uh, the top still are taken off. But um, the top story of the Carnegie Library, before it was condemned, uh, was the scene of the meeting of the high school in Ardmore which was the Lincoln School then and now. And the high school was part of the Lincoln School. And uh, the, the uh, seniors and the higher grades would go to the library for recitations and so forth until the high school was built. Uh, the, the city schools, I, I mean the city government uh, was uh, a mayor and alderman. They had a kind of good police force and uh, uh, fire department. Of course, all the fire fighting equipment was then horse-drawn vehicles. They had a good bunch of teams that drew those uh, uh, firefighting vehicles until they finally became re replaced with motor-drawn trucks. And then, of course, there was uh, the uh, old Indian Territory Courts. There's one little story about, uh, told about a fellow by the name of uh, Moran Scott, who uh, was appointed United States Commissioner. He moved to Gainesville. And uh, he was a son of old Dr. Scott at Gainesville, who was uh, uh, pretty well fixed and had a servant by the name of Mose. And uh, it seems as though Brother Moran uh, boasted of the fact that he was judge of the United States Commission, was caught up in Indian Territory, and he would uh, talk that his friends, and so all the time it came for him to go back home, and he got on the Santa Fe train in Ardmore and went back to Gainesville, and the uh, Moorland family had their house servant, Moore's, the meek, no judge, Moorland Scott, at the train at Gainesville. And uh, the first thing he asked Moses was, would anybody at Gainesville know 
that he was judge of the United States Commissioner's Court in Indian Territory, up at Ardmore. And Moe says, yes, Mark Bowler, and they know it. And he's, and the old Moe said, well, what did they say about it? And the Moe said, Mark Bowler, and they don't say nothing, they just laugh. About you being judge of the United States Commissioner, of course, in Indian Territory. But, uh, after a while, in 1907, I was legislated out of the job that I had, and I had to go to work for myself, which I did, and I've been doing that ever since. Uh, now, did you have very, uh, very many dealings with the Indians here in Arkansas? No, no. The Indians were, were not very many, and you couldn't tell the Indians what from anybody else. They were pretty well intermarried and um, had lost their identity as Indians to a large extent. I remember one Indian named Phil Turner that lived on the corner of Stanley and uh, uh, B Street, I believe it was. Uh, as I said before, I was in the United States Attorney's Office and uh, Clint Bond was a um, court reporter for Judge Townsend, who was the United States judge here. And uh, W. B. Johnson was United States Attorney, and uh, I held an insignificant job in that in the United States Attorney's office. The pay was sufficient to keep me and my new bride going. One day, one morning, I was in Judge Townsend's office, and Clint Bond and was expecting Mr. Johnson, the United States Attorney, to be there. And um, this, uh, there was an Indian named Apollo Turner came in and said he was looking for W. B. Johnson. Well, I told Bond, who was uh, gifted, was uh, trying to create a little humor once in a while, and said, why, well, Mr. Johnson's in swamp and rock stumpers. And the fellow turned and says, Yes, more or less get out of us. And so, uh, uh, now he wasn't much of an Indian. Uh, he couldn't have come back with that kind of repartee. I, I, uh, I think most of the Indians then like they are now, they're pretty well intermingled with white people. Now, as I said before, I lived at Paul Valley in the year 1900, which was uh, at the turn of the century. But a great topic of discussion that year, in addition to uh, making this Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory one state was whether or not that was the last year of the vanishing century or the first year of the new century. Those two, those two uh, uh, subjects were the great topics of discussion wherever men and women would get together. Well, after I came to uh, Ardmore, um, there was uh, lots of changes made, of course, 
for the advent of statehood. Uh, and people thought that uh, all they needed to get rid of all of the ills of life would be uh, the right of local self-government. But prior to the advent of statehood, there was no taxes to pay, and people got along better when they didn't have those taxes, so many taxes to pay, so much tax to pay, as it appears now. Uh, but everybody wanted local self-government. They, they thought that uh, all of their burdens would be over with if they had the right of local self-government. And of course, local self-government is one of the great prizes that all free men and all civilized men like to have. Now I get that. I was born in Tennessee, and in a long time, I guess we both, I don't know. 18 and 81. We lived in Tennessee until I was eight years old. And you know, the name. And, my, and they gave me the name of William Curl Biggs. My father moved to uh, West, West Texas at Miracle. And we lived there four years, and then we moved to Indian Territory. And uh, that was 60, uh, 62 years ago. How did you travel then? We came by train from Tennessee to Merkel. But when we moved uh, up to Erin Springs, we, there was no railroad train. We came through the wagons. I think we had five wagons with our household goods. So how long did it take you? Four days. Mm -hmm. well, at night, did you sleep in the wagon? Well, all part of the moon gardens up on the ground, some in the wagon. When, when you got there, did you have to build your house? Well, part of our house moved, but the man we got in the right built the moment for and so we didn't have any house. And they moved in the back of the store for Dad and Buck. And uh, then we sent some wagons over to West Springs and got the lumber. And, built more onto it so we'd have room. And I lived there for about nine months. And that's where I was married at the end of spring. And that was just a few months before Lindsay was surveyed, the town of Lindsay. Then you moved to Paul Valley. Then um, about six months and then came to Ardmore. Well, now, uh, as Mr. Howard stated, you built your home here. Uh, what was the house like? We had five rooms on this lot, and they had we built our people that we bought the lot from had a garden. And we had cabbage patch in the front yard. We lived here then until 19 and 1917, we knew that house off and built this house. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of furniture did you have? Well, the bed. Yeah, not that bed. Just about like we did now, and we didn't have any waterworks nor any uh, gas. We had to burn wood. We had a well in the back. And right at the back door, and had to draw water. Could you tell me a little bit of what Ardmore was like? By that I mean the size of the town and how it was located. 
Well, it was just Main Street, where Main Street is now, and uh, no sidewalks except a few of the stores had little wooden sidewalks, the shelters over them, and the cages walk up Main Street, and there was a well in the middle of the, of the Main Street, and the people would come in in wagons and water them in, get water to drink out of that well at the Van Main Street. And when there'd be a circus in town where they'd uh, come the night before in wagons, maybe two days before, and uh, an awful crowd would be gathering in to see the circus and have to stay for two nights in town. The missus telling you about the circuses, there was um, an old fellow, that uh, an Englishman, named uh, Simpson, that uh, lived out west of Ardmore, and the uh, people coming to the circus would come from over on the Rock Island and everywhere, you know. And uh, two wagons came driving pretty close to the neighborhood of where this old Englishman lived. And the cattle had been breaking in his uh, farm, in his crop. And uh, he had a uh, family of boys and always kept several hard hands around. And they had these boys armed with uh, guns. And um, they run the cattle out of the crop. And they were in a little clump of bushes uh, by the side of the road, and uh, these two wagon loads of people coming to go to the circus. And the fella in the front wagon uh, stopped right opposite where this bunch of boys was laying in the brush and uh, said, uh, uh, I'm lost. I don't know just where we are. And when the other wagon came up, uh, the fella in that wagon got out and uh, he says, well, if we're where I think we are, if everybody will be quiet, he says there's an old fella, an old Dutchman lives close by. And uh, they never sleep. Now, and if you'll be quiet for just a minute, you'll hear some of them hollering. Just at that moment when things got still, this bunch of boys raised up and give the Comanche war whoop and discharged their firearms. And both teams, Hitched to those uh, two wagons, run away, mm -hmm. and run down the road uh, half a mile or such a matter. And uh, finally, they got them stopped, and nobody was hurt. And this fella in the rear wagon caught up with him, and he says, "Now there, what did I tell you?" Some some of the uh, boys that was in that crowd that was guarding old man Simpson's uh, farm that night was uh, one of them especially was Homer Britton who passed away about a month ago here in Ardmore. At one time he was, uh, and for a long time, he was the conductor on the train that run on the Ringland Railroad. Now there's Bob Simpson, son of the old man. He's now about uh, a little more than 80 years old. And he lives at Lone Grove. And I think rural Britain was one of them. Bob, uh, uh, Homer Britain told me this story many years ago. And after he had told it to me, I wanted to get confirmation of it, and I asked Bob Simpson about it, and he confirmed the story and told it just exactly like 
former Britain had told, told it to me. What were the churches like? Well, <clears throat> when we came here, the Methodist Church was uh, building then what was known as uh, Old Broadway. And uh, it was uh, the Broadway Methodist Church then met in uh, a two-story brick building on South Washington Street that uh, blowed away in a storm in February uh, about eight or ten years ago. And it's the same building that uh, uh, Jess Mason got buried in and but came out without a scratch. And uh, they met upstairs in that building and uh, while the new Broadway Methodist Church was being built. After this church was being built, after we got well settled and the church was, uh, new church building was built. Uh, that's where uh, me and my family all joined. My two boys were had come along by then, and we joined that church. And it remained the church that we attended until the Methodist Church, First Methodist Church now, was built down on Main and E. West yes. Main and E. And the church is where the jail now stands, the courthouse. Yes. And the old Cumberland Presbyterian Church is where the courthouse now stands. And it, it con consolidated with uh, the First Presbyterian Church, which was then just an ordinary wooden structure. Since been replaced by a fine building. Did you ever attend any political rallies? Yes. <clears throat> Those days, uh, the political rallies were largely uh, torch-like processions, boosting the man that uh, they wanted to have elected. I remember one uh, political meeting that uh, happened here in Ardmore during the days when Bob Dick was mayor. Uh, Bob Dick was right progressive, and some people thought that uh, maybe he was spending too much public money and getting too little results. And there came a fellow here by the name of Russell who started what was then the New State News. And uh, he was one of the accusers of Bob Dick. So they called uh, an, indig an indignation meeting. Uh, when that meeting was called to order, and it was held in the old opera house uh, upstairs over uh, where A&P grocery store is now. It was then known as the Robertson Opera House. Uh, when that meeting was called to order, Bob Dick arose and said that he arose to on a plea of privilege, personal privilege, and he was granted the right to speak. And among other things, I remember this, this that he said, that uh, it's impossible for me as your mayor to 
get away with any of the public funds. We have a little book down there at the city hall where we write down on one side all of the money that comes in and on the other all of the money that goes out. It's impossible for me as a public official to wipe any of your money. This, this same Bob Dick uh, initiated the waterworks system and the sewer system that now supplies Ardmore. And it was his ingenuity and forethought that uh, brought about the big city lake. And the way he did that was to get people to donate money and uh, afterwards uh, had a bond issue and everybody who donated the money and would take it back, was paid back all that they had donated. And uh, he made us a good mayor and made Ardmore to grow. And Bob Dick was afterwards then the first uh, warden of the penitentiary uh, after statehood and built the penitentiary at McAllen. This interview was taken by Ann Myers, a senior in Ardmore High School, 1955-56. Full time.